Welcome, and thank you so much for coming to this important event today. Uh, my name is Russell Hill, and I serve as the director of the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology. So in this magnificent building up next to us, we have around 100 people within IMET, within this institute, working together on some of the key challenges related to climate change, food, energy, environmental sustainability, and human health. And I'm briefly going to mention a few of the research projects. So we have an important project led by Professor Chen looking at cycling of carbon in the deep oceans. This is the sort of fundamental research we need to be doing to really understand the process of climate change. One of our huge strengths is our research program on truly sustainable aquaculture, led by Professor Zohar with many of our colleagues. And uh, in this program, we're looking at ways of doing aquaculture in an entirely new approach that has very little environmental impact. So this is land-based recirculating marine aquaculture and it can be done wherever you need the seafood. So you're cutting down on the uh, carbon footprint related to transportation of food as well. And I think one of our more exciting and recent projects is work on microscopic algae, looking at algae as a source of biofuels. And this has already led to a small company in Maryland. Um, this area has huge potential. So if we can come up with ways to grow algae cheaply enough, we have a truly sustainable, carbon-neutral source of fuel for things like airplanes and ships. So hopefully we'll all soon be driving electric cars, but we still need that carbon-neutral fuel for planes and ships. There's real potential here. We just have to get the economics right, and it's getting remarkably close. So areas of huge hope, but where fundamental research is still needed. So we're very proud of our international collaborations. In, in 2018, we collaborated with 25 countries. We're training the next generation of environmental scientists. So we have around 50 graduate students working on their doctorates using molecular approaches to study some of these key areas that I've mentioned to you. So to move on to our event today, we are thrilled to be joined by our group of EU ambassadors, and the ambassadors will be introduced to you shortly. I want to briefly uh, just recognize some of our other important guests here today. We've been joined by Treasurer Kopp, the Treasurer of Maryland, and we're delighted to have Bob Carette, the uh, Chancellor of the University System of Maryland, overseeing the 12 universities in the University System of Maryland. Uh, Bob is with us, as well as Assistant Secretary Charles Glass from the uh, Maryland Department of Transportation. We've also been joined by Dean Lee and Professors Dong and Zhu, who are visiting us from the Ocean University of China, where we have some very productive collaborations, and by Frank Bird, who's the president of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. So thank you to our honored guests and to all of you for being here for this important event today. You can read, the, for the speakers, you can read longer biographies in the program that you have, for those of you doing social media here, hashtag united, the number four, climate. United for climate. And the EU delegation's Twitter feed is at EU in the US. And now I'm really happy to be introducing President Peter Goodwin, president of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. So Peter is professor within UMSIS and our president. He's an internationally recognized expert in ecosystem restoration, eco-hydraulics, and enhancement of river, wetland, and estuarine systems. Peter.
Well, thank you, Dr. Hill, for those uh, introductory remarks, and good afternoon, everyone. As the president of the University System of Maryland's premier environmental research institution, it's my distinct honor to moderate today's important discussion on actions to combat the rapidly growing threat of climate change. Unfortunately, the WMO statement on emissions report that was released last month combined with the Sentinel 2019 IPCC reports on our lands and oceans have shown that greenhouse gas emissions are still climbing. The cryosphere and oceans are changing rapidly. Sea levels continue to rise at alarming rates and threats from extreme floods, droughts, disease and heat waves threaten our communities. Despite these consequences and the United States government's current lack of leadership on actions to reduce emissions, many sectors of our society continue to take actions to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accord. For example, Second Nature is a large group of US universities, including all 12 of the USM institutions that have signed on to actions that integrate carbon neutrality with climate resilience and provides a systems approach to mitigating and adapting to climate change. Further, many local governments, cities and states have taken significant actions to reduce carbon emissions towards sustainability. Since 2007, the state of Maryland has had a commission on climate change and significant goals have been set to reduce emissions 40% by 2030 and significant reductions beyond 2030. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Maryland Secretary of Natural Resources, the Honorable Jean Hadaway Riccio, who is a member of the Climate Change Commission. She leads the Adaptation and Resiliency Working Group. Prior to being appointed secretary, she worked for Governor Hogan on a wide range of environmental issues and has also served as a member of the House of Delegates. So, Secretary Hadaway Riccio, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Goodwin. On behalf of the Hogan administration and on behalf of the Governor's Bay Cabinet, I wanna thank you for your leadership and your continued partnership on important environmental issues here in Maryland. Um, I also want to thank and acknowledge Dr. Hill and the team here at the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology for hosting us today. And it certainly is an honor to be joining um, Treasurer Kopp and our representatives from the European Union that are with us. Nationally, the cost of extreme weather and climate-related disasters is climbing. This year was the fifth consecutive year in which we had 10 or more billion dollar incidents uh, related to impacts from climate change. And locally, Maryland is geographically located in one of the most vulnerable areas of our nation. Shoreline erosion, coastal flooding, saltwater intrusion, and inundation of our coastal areas are just a few of the implications that we deal with. It's also a matter of public safety and health and security, given the fact that we need to protect valuable infrastructure that is already stressed and impacted due to heavy rains and severe weather. Under Governor Hogan's leadership, Maryland has been an absolute leader in addressing climate change. We are striving to lead by example in three major ways. The first is smart planning. The second is building resiliency through green infrastructure. And the third is making a strong investment in our future. So in terms of smart planning, in 2016, Governor Hogan signed into law a goal of achieving a 40% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. But a goal is really just a goal without an implementation plan. So last month, the Maryland Department of the Environment, my department, the Department of Natural Resources, and the other environmental agencies in the Governor's Bay Cabinet released a draft plan that includes over 100 specific actions that we can take to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. This draft plan, which is out for public comment now, sets Maryland on a very ambitious path forward, and it serves for a model as how other states can address this issue. Specifically, some of the actions include investment in energy efficiency, 
clean and renewable energy solutions, more widespread adoption of electric vehicles, and for our department, it means increasing forest management and increasing land conservation efforts. To build resiliency through green infrastructure, we have been working with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, who helped establish some science-based sea level rise projections for Maryland. Maryland is using these projections and has incorporated architecture, engineering, construction, and design standards for certain state-funded infrastructure to account for rising sea levels and flooding. This ensures that our projects are more resilient, but it also ensures that we are being wise stewards of taxpayer dollars. We're also using nature-based solutions, and to further this effort, Governor Hogan established a new innovative grant program, a first of its kind, that allows us to implement projects to protect communities, infrastructure, and public resources. With this investment to date, we have supported 16 projects across the state in communities to enhance their resiliency to the effects of climate change at vulnerable locations. And last but not least, Maryland has made a conscious effort to invest in the future by launching the nation's first state-sponsored Climate Leadership Academy. We're very proud of the fact that the Academy is helping local government officials, state employees, nonprofit organizations, and representatives from the private sector be prepared to address the impacts of global warming. And so far, the Academy has trained nearly 475 professionals through six different cohorts with more to come. In closing, these are just a few ways that Maryland is leading by example. It's really hard to talk about all that we're doing in just a short amount of time, but I hope that gives you a sense of the activities that we're undertaking to create a roadmap for the future on climate change, both locally and nationally. And again, we are very fortunate to be joined by the EU ambassadors who will help us get a more global perspective on how we create a roadmap for the future. But in order to really have a roadmap for the future, we all have to work together. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this event today so that we can continue to collaborate on our response. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Hadaway Rikio. And as you can see, uh, we appreciate not just those comments, but also your leadership on environmental issues in the state. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's panelists, those that have brought us all together today. And what I will ask is that is, as I introduce the various ambassadors, if they would like to come up and take their seats at the front. So our first ambassador before his appointment as Portugal's ambassador to the United States and the Bahamas in 2015, His Excellency Domingos Fezas Vital was a representative to the European Union and its ambassador. <laughs> Secondly, Her Excellency Karen Olesdotter, Sweden's ambassador to the United States since 2017. She has served in various posts, including to the European Union, the United States, Russia, and as the ambassador to Hungary. Welcome. In September 2019, His Excellency Philippe Etienne was appointed as France's ambassador to the United States. Over his long and distinguished career, he has served in many countries, including as France's ambassador to Romania and to Germany. Welcome. And finally, I'd like to introduce the Charged Affairs of Spain, Cristina Freyel. She has served in multiple countries representing Spain, including Senegal, Brazil, India, and Austria. Welcome. I'd just like to remind the audience that in the, fu the full bios are in the program that you have. So if you need to read more and understand the contributions of the ambassadors, please take a look. What I'm going to do is to invite each panelist to give opening remarks on the actions that their countries are taking to avert the current climate crisis. And then we'll have time for questions. And we do appreciate your willingness to 
uh, engaged with the audience. So for those of you uh, in the audience, you'll see there's cards on your seats. If you have a question uh, during the presentations, please write them down, pass them to the assistants at the end, and then we'll try and field as many of those questions as possible uh, following the presentations. So with that, I'd like to invite His Excellency uh, Ambassador Vital to give opening remarks. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Russell Hill, first of all, I think that I speak for all of us in uh, telling you how delighted we are to be here with you uh, this morning, this wonderful day uh, in Baltimore at this institute. Uh, I think that one of the things that an ambassador realizes very quickly when arriving in the United States is how important it is to talk to local authorities and to institutions of the civil society. And so I would like to start by thanking the Institute for hosting us here today, for opening its doors to this EU Reach Out initiative, and for your outstanding contribution for a more sustainable future. Um, well, COP25 started yesterday. And the first reports and indications that we are getting from that meeting uh, make absolutely clear that we are not facing uh, an urgency, an urgent situation. What we are facing is global emergency, which is, I would say, even stronger and even worse. And so the response has been asked to be to an emergency situation. Um, you just started, uh, Dr. Russell, by saying that we were expected to tell you a little bit about what our countries have been doing to respond to this emergency. I have to tell you that in the case of Portugal, it's not possible to talk about what we have been doing in Portugal without talking about the European Union policies. We are a European Union member state. And so the framework that applies to Portugal, the set of rules and standards, is the European Union set of rules and standards. Well, as far as the European Union is concerned, we, of course, uh, we can never be satisfied, but I think that we have reasons to be proud of what has been achieved since 1990. So we've um, made sure that we had a reduction in emissions in the European Union this year that attained 22% against a goal that was set in the, um, in the agreements of 20%. But there is a very important factor that I think should be underlined, which is the fact that since 1990, our economy grew by 61% in the European Union, which makes absolutely clear to everybody that it is compatible, a policy that bets on sustainable development and economic development. As Madam Secretary has just explained us a few minutes ago, talking about the future roadmap for the state of, uh, of Maryland. The European Union is also, in terms of uh, funding, one of the most important um, funding entities in the world. Together with the European member states, the European Union provides 20 billion euros by year for action policies all over the world. What about the future? Our goal is 40% of emissions reduction by 2030. We have a new commission that is very committed to a sustainable policy in the European Union. So in the days to come, the European Commission is uh, expected to table a Green Deal, which will be a general document that will frame all European Union policies with one single objective, sustainable development. And as far as the funding, our development funding, uh, the European Union these days, uh, the projects that have been funded and will continue to be funded are no longer projects that bet on fossil fuels. This is a general policy that has been applied and will continue to be applied. Our main, 
main funding institution, the European Investment Bank, will reorient its policy to make sure that projects that bet on renewables and sustainable development will be a priority. As far as Portugal is concerned, our figures are good and we have reasons to be happy with that. As I told you, we cannot be satisfied when the emergency is the situation we have to tackle. But we are within targets, European targets, and as far as the energy sector is concerned, the uh, results in Portugal are the three times, threefold, what was the main objective of the European Union. There is a national bet on renewables. We are very proud to be the country that set the world record of an economy exclusively based on renewables. For three days, the Portuguese economy ran exclusively on the basis of renewables. And um, we have already tabled our national plan for 2050 uh, with the aim of having a carbon neutral economy, total carbon neutral economy by 2050. There are two uh, issues of particular concern for Portugal, and they will not come as a surprise to you, just have to look at our geographical position to understand what I'm talking about. One is draft, the impact of climate change in terms of draft. We have a committee in Portugal with different stakeholders, uh, national institutions, ministries, agencies, that meet regularly to discuss the situation and to provide the government with uh, draft proposals for measures to be taken to address the, uh, the situation. And the second one is the oceans. Well, uh, just look where we are. Portugal has one of the largest exclusive economic uh, zones in the world. And so what happens with the oceans is, of course, of utmost importance for us as a country. Well. In 2017, we had the first UN Oceans Conference in New York that came up with a document, which is a sort of roadmap, called Our Ocean, Our, Our Future, a call for action. Well, the second UN um, conference, Oceans Conference, will be held next year in June in Lisbon. And the title will be the, uh, the, the, the issue that will be uh, dealt with will be scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation. Well, being here at this institute, I think uh, we couldn't have found a better issue to, to tackle. Well, uh, we will have a preparatory meeting uh, in February where we will be deciding together with uh, all member states and institutions participating the issues that will be addressed in Lisbon and how are we going to address them? Well, the contribution coming from the, social, the civil society is crucial for the success of this meeting. So my final appeal will be to the Institute, to the Center, please come and join us in Lisbon and tell us your story and give us your contribution to a more sustainable future, a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us here today and thanks to everyone who's organizing. I don't think the timing of this uh, gathering here in, in, in Baltimore could be more timely, uh, coinciding of course with COP25 in, in, in Spain. Well, uh, I would like to just say a few words on how we are uh, dealing with climate change and emissions in Sweden. We've been fairly successful. So if the EU economy uh, at large has grown by 61% uh, and emissions are down by 20%, uh, 22%, right? Uh, we have cut our emissions by 26% at the same time and grown our economy by 70%. And this has, of course, been done gradually over the years. So early 1990s, we introduced a carbon tax uh, that started out at the level of $25 per, per ton. It's now up to 110 US dollars per ton. Uh, so the gradual increase has uh, made it possible for industry uh, and the population at large to adjust, of course, to the cost, cost of this. But this is one of the main reasons why we have been uh, able to be so uh, successful. 
My government, I think this is all also competition between governments, which is of course good. Uh, my government has declared that Sweden wants to become the first fossil free welfare nation in the world. So how do we then go about that? Um, we have said that by 2045, uh, we will have zero net emissions of greenhouse gases, and that's decided by our parliament. These issues, by the way, are totally, uh, uh, the, the whole spectrum of governmental parties in Sweden are united on this. So this is not even a political issue. Uh, it's just a matter of a discussion on how to do it, not that we are going to do it. Just want to, to make that clear, which I think is also very important to, to be successful with, with reforms. And by 2040, 100% uh, of our electricity uh, will come from re renewable sources. And uh, we will also, uh, by 2030, uh, so all the vehicles sold in Sweden, or 70% of all vehicles sold in Sweden should be uh, then uh, based on fossil free uh, fuel. And what I think is most important is that industry has really taken this uh, upon themselves to change our society. And Greta Thunberg, you know, the Swedish climate activist who just arrived in Lisbon, actually, uh, on her way now to Spain, she said that no one is too small to make a difference. But it's very, very important that the big ones uh, make a difference. So 15 business sectors in Sweden have now uh, elaborated roadmaps uh, for how they will be uh, fossil free uh, till the mid, mid of the century. And Sweden is a very heavily industrialized country, uh, huge in mining, in uh, technology, of course, heavy industry, pulp and paper, uh, and the cement industry. And all these industries have then taken upon themselves to, 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 to through 2050, be fossil free. And one very exciting project, which is the closest at hand, is uh, our steel company, SSAB, huge in the United States as well, employing lots of Americans, have come up with a new technology uh, called hybrid, which makes it possible to produce steel uh, using hydrogen instead of uh, coking coal um, in, in the production. So this will actually be the first fossil free uh, steel manufacturing in the world and their products will be on the market in 2026 and of course this will make a huge difference to the automotive industry, to heavy industry that uses a lot of steel and so on. So that's just shortly on, on how we work on these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having us here. Um, we, we are indeed at a very timely moment with uh, COP25 uh, taking place in Madrid. And uh, I think we must uh, be very thankful to Spain uh, to have uh, accepted at the very last moment to host uh, this conference after Chile was not uh, able to, to have it as uh, it had been foreseen. Chile had taken over from Brazil one year ago. So thanks to Spain, we have this so important, such, so important conference. France inside the EU, because as uh, Domingo, my Portuguese colleague, has said, it's really a European Union core policy, and EU sees itself in, in, a, in a role of leadership in this policy. It's one of the big successful stories in the EU, not only because we, we fight for a global ch uh, challenge, but also, uh, as my Swedish colleague has said, because we are convinced in the EU it is good for our economy. It creates jobs through innovation. And we are proud as France to be in this, in this group. And we want um, also to tell, as uh, my Portuguese colleague has said, that we want to continue to work with the United States. Although we regret very much as EU the decision of withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, we know having hosted the COP uh, in Paris, COP21, which has led to the Paris Agreement at the end of 2015, that these negotiations are not only for states, these negotiations are for civil societies, are for local authorities, are for science, are for business and finance. And I want to, to thank Maryland also to be part of the uh, US uh, Climate Alliance, uh, which is a bipartisan alliance of uh, governors across the United States. I want also to thank the universities of Maryland and this institute in particular, because science and the higher education are part of this coalition. So we will continue to work with the United States in spite of this decision. And we can work with the United States in all sectors 
agriculture, as you said in your introduction, uh, sustainable transport, uh, science innovation, energy efficiency, um, finance, green finance, all of this is possible because the U.S. is the U.S. and you have so, so many important actors and stakeholders here. So thank you to all of you. We expect from France the COP25 to send a very strong political signal to achieve the objective of carbon neutrality by 2050. France is committed to this objective, like uh, my, my other colleagues said, for their own countries. It will be probably one of the most important topics at the agenda of the heads of state and government of the European Union, who meet many, more than one time every year, in particular at the end of each year, there will be a European summit in December, in two weeks, and it will be one of the most important items on the agenda of uh, uh, the work for our leaders. And we cannot do any way, uh, we, we have no choice. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you have mentioned this report, in this last report has really documented the fact that the emergency is very, very, very great, as uh, Domingos said, and we, we, we are losing the battle, actually, if we do not. And this is very much our priority in view of COP25, but also in COP26, which will take place at the, in one year in Glasgow, mm -hmm. to raise the level of our ambitions, to raise the level of our ambitions as it is forcing in the Paris Climate Agreement, we, the so-called INDCs. Otherwise, we will really lose the battle, and we know what it means because, as we say, usually after one Secretary General of the United Nations, there is no planet B. So France, as, as far as it is concerned, um, we, what have we done recently? We have hosted the first replenishment of the Green Climate Fund, a global conference. The U.S. is out, will not any more finance, so we had to, to provide with more financing from other countries. And it was a success, this conference at the end of October agreed over $9.8 billion of funding for the 2020-2023 period. Uh, and we, as France, have announced to double our contributions. Uh, so uh, we, with other countries, by the way, including Sweden, we have decided to double our contribution to, uh, to, to, to bridge the gap created by, by the US uh, leaving the Green Climate Fund, which is absolutely in essential to finance climate actions in developing countries, in those uh, poor countries which have no finances, public finances to do that. But we have also, uh, number two, started to mobilize private finance. We are at the origin, uh, our president is at the origin of what we call the One Planet Summit, where we organized them with the United Nations and with the World Bank. And it's about mobilizing the sovereign funds, including in uh, oil producing countries, in the Gulf countries, mobilizing asset managers to understand that investing in the future uh, for those who have the most, uh, most, most important resources means investing in uh, uh, sustainable uh, projects. Um, we, so third point, we, we make a connection between uh, cl climate uh, change, the fight against climate change, and protection of biodiversity. Those, the, those two big challenges are more and more interlinked, and we will have next year a very important meeting in China, in Kunming, COP15, of the Convention of Biological in Diversity. It is important to engage China on both issues. You mentioned the presence here of Chinese uh, colleagues, and uh, we issued the presidents of France and China issued last November, one month ago, a so-called Beijing call on biodiversity conservation and climate change. Uh, fourth point, fires. We, we see uh, how fires, uh, Portugal knows it, France also, uh, even Sweden, Sweden <laughs> also, uh, well, all countries actually, mm -hmm. but also we see in Amazon, in Africa, in California, in Australia, it's absolutely tragic to biodiversity, but also very detrimental to our fight against climate change. So we have launched a Tropical Forests Alliance in New York last September, and we announced $500 million dedicated to the fight against deforestation. It's only the beginning. Um, 
internally, we have, uh, uh, it will be my last point, I, I try to, to be quick. We have uh, now, uh, we are discussing an, a new bill, anti-waste, anti-waste bill in France, which, which is absolutely crucial to foster the circular economy. We see more and more awareness in our populations uh, to, to, to stop uh, the patterns of consumption we have been living with uh, until now. And this is also absolutely crucial. We, for instance, have launched at the G7 summit, which France has hosted in Biarritz last August, the so-called Fashion Pact, which is a commitment by the textile industry to drastically uh, uh, diminish its uh, 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 emissions of uh, plastic uh, waste into the oceans. Um, we are committed, as I said, to reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. We do that uh, with a different set of very concrete measures. Um, legislation to ban oil exploration production by 2040, uh, ban combustion-powered vehicles by 2040, which is very, very uh, bold for a country like my country, for which the car industry is so important, it's a, a revolution. And now we have uh, premiums, we have uh, incentive, financial incentives for every French uh, family uh, ready to change cars. We had 300,000 French people who did that uh, last year. Um, we have set ourselves the objective of reducing our fossil fuel consumption by 40% by 2030 instead of the previous objective of 30%. We have decided to shut down our last four coal-fired power plants by 2022. Very, very uh, painful decisions for the communities working in those places. But again, we try to convince them that finally we will create more jobs than we will destroy. But we have to address this. And as EU, and I will uh, finish um, by saying this, we are very happy that the new president of the president of the new European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and I think that Domingo mentioned it, has announced for the EU as a, a whole a European Green Deal. And we have proposed uh, in this framework the creation of a European Climate Bank, the greening of the European budget, the creation of a fair transition fund to help social, those, those socially affected by these transitions in electricity energy and uh, climate policies, and also the introduction of a carbon mechanism at our borders to prevent uh, carbon leakages and unfair competition uh, with those countries who don't, who don't take the measures necessary uh, and they, they should uh, commit to in the framework of this global challenge. Finally, our figures, since my colleagues have mentioned them, our greenhouse gas emissions in France have decreased by 16% compared to 1990, while our population has increased by 15%, our GDP by nearly 49%. Here are our figures. It's like Eurovision contest. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having us. Um, the ambassador of Spain is in Spain at the moment, uh, but we thought it was important that um, Spain was represented at this table to explain why we have taken this very short notice decision to host the COP25 in Madrid. So, you know, this is, um, it was just about to be labeled the doomed COP because it was supposed, you know, the COP is the conference of the parties of the um, um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change um, and they meet every year and they try to develop and advance the rules that have been set by the uh, UN Convention and by the subsequent treaties that have been adopted by the parties uh, and namely the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. Um, so this uh, COP25 was supposed to take place in Brazil but then the Brazilian government decided uh, to cancel the offer and on what was thought to be a very short notice, only one year in advance, Chile accepted to host the, um, the COP in Santiago. But due to social unrest, the president of Chile announced less than one month ago that it was no longer possible. 
to host uh, the um, COP as foreseen in, in the Chilean capital. So everybody thought, well, that, let's skip the COP this year and let's wait for 2020 because in any case, the news, the big news will come up in 2020 because this is when the um, um, individual countries' commitments need to be renewed every other year. But then Spain thought, um, this, is not a, this wouldn't send a good message to the international community. In this um, context in which we are right now, when um, the United States has, has decided to officially and formally withdraw from the Paris Agreement, and a decision that will take effect in, in one year, um, at a time where the calls for um, an emergency situation, as the ambassador of Portugal has said, are growing bigger and bigger. And our civil societies and our youth are um, being more and more adamant for, for action. We thought it would send, to just skip the COP25, would send exactly the wrong signal to the world. And we decided, okay, let's coordinate with Chile. Let's skip Chile as the uh, chair of the um, COP and, uh, and let's host it in Madrid. Fortunately, we have the necessary infrastructure, both in terms of transportation and accommodation. It is indeed a challenge because we will be receiving delegations. We are receiving the COP started yesterday and will last until the 12th of, um, of December, 13th of December. Um, it is a challenge, not only in terms of logistic support, but also in terms of, it is an institutional challenge as well, because you need to change the agendas of all the government and all the institutions that need to take part in this. And, an, and a great dose of coordination with Chile is necessary. But we did, we did so because we thought it was, otherwise would be, as I said, sending the wrong message and it was also out of solidarity with our Chilean uh, friends and out of uh, conviction that it is only through multilateral uh, negotiations that a global challenge such as climate change can be dealt with. And therefore, this very important um, institutional structure that has been created by the United Nations needs, needs to go, keep on working and keep at the good job. This uh, commitment to multilateralism is also expressed in the way of our belonging to the European Union and our um, ambassadors from, from th three different uh, member states have already expressed this. The, the commitment of each individual country in the EU cannot be explained without our commitment to the European Union, which has the leadership in these issues and which sets the thresholds and the targets that we all need to... Um, to reach. Chile, that is, um, as I said, uh, keeping the uh, chair of the COP25, has labeled the COP as the blue COP in reference to the importance of the oceans and water. And Chile is indeed a country that, because of its uh, extensive uh, coastline, is very much aware of the importance of um, uh, the effects of climate change in our oceans in terms of the rise in temperatures, of the rise of level, and also in pollution. And by the way, I would like to, to open a, um, a very brief parenthesis to thank the organizers for a very simple gesture that you've had today, and this glasses of water <laughs> instead of plastic water, of plastic bottles. Thank you so much. This is a very small gesture, but a very strong message. Thank you. So, um, the, what we expect from this um, COP, that is no longer hopefully a doomed COP, what we expect to, to get from it is um, to keep up the um, uh, tension and the awareness of the international community, not only governments, but also businesses and also the civil society and the public opinion and to advance on, th on some of the rules that haven't been totally agreed to in the previous um, uh, COPs that have taken place. And in particular, there is one article, Article 6, of which um, 
most of you have probably heard of, which is the one in the Paris Agreement that refers to the market-based approaches, so to the possibility that um, lower emission countries can trade the rights of emission for countries with higher levels of emission. This helps establishing prices. It establishes a, a general cap for emissions, of course, but it also establ uh, helps establishing a price for car carbon. And it, in, in doing so, we believe it, it will be extremely useful in capping the general uh, emissions target. There hasn't been, it, this was not possible to agree to in the last um, COP in Katowice that agreed to the Paris um, rule book. And we hope that in Madrid negotiations will advance in, the, in this matter. I will not be giving you a lot of uh, figures about Spain because you know the, all the others have already been um, giving you plenty of figures. Um, but I would like to make a point that despite the fact that the US government has decided to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, um, there is a still a great need in the international community for leadership. And the European Union and Spain as a member of the European Union would very much like to count on US cooperation and US leadership in this matter. This can be done through many uh, ways, uh, through the US Climate Alliance that has already been mentioned and to which the governor of Maryland, to whom we have been talking this morning, is also a member and has shown his um, um, absolute commitment to the matter. Also through the businesses, some of uh, uh, the speakers that have preceded me have already spoken about the need to engage the private sector, and this is extremely important. And the U.S. is also present in the, in the COP25 in many other ways. So yesterday, the, at the opening session of the COP25, the Speaker of the House, a um, Baltimore native, um, Nancy Pelosi, was there and gave a very strong, strong message in favor of climate action and a very powerful um, signal of how urgent this emergency is. I would like to say one final word about the implication of civil society and public opinion. And this is, I believe, one of the reasons that have led my government to decide to host the COP25. The engagement of public opinion, of um, uh, civil society, is extremely important. And Spain is among the um, populations in the European Union that is most, has shown the most concern about uh, climate change. Um, I've read today that it's the Portuguese who are most concerned. Uh, above 90% of Portuguese population shows concern about climate action, and Spain is second to that, with 89% of our population showing concern. But also believing a great doses of optimism, showing a great doses of optimism, believing that it is not too late and we can still do it, we can still make it. To do that, we need the support of all of you. Um, civil society, civil institutions, governments, private enterprise, and um, as has been mentioned at the beginning by Dr. Hill, um, research, the scientific community. It is extremely important to count on the foundings, on the research of the scientific community to keep up, to keep up this work that is not only essential, but it is um, the guarantee of the, subsist uh, sub of the existence of our planet. Thank you very much. I think we're ready for the questions now. Well, thank you for the inspiring message and to learn more about what you're doing in your countries. And it's, I think, very inspiring for us to see the internal competition as to uh, implementing many of these activities. First of all, I would like to just give the apologies from uh, His Excellency Vital. As you saw, he had to leave. He's been summoned back to Lisbon because our secretary, uh, Pompeo, is actually visiting. And so he's had to run and take a flight. So with those ap apologies, um, I'm going to pick out a few questions here. And first of all, what I would 
like to just reiterate is I think we all owe a huge debt to Spain. And I think it's one of these examples that this issue goes beyond politics. Political unrest will, will last five years, a decade. But the diversity, biodiversity we heard about, these are on the millennial scales. So let's have a round of applause for Spain for ensuring that continues. So there are several questions here, and so I'm going to try and merge some of these questions together. And th the first question here is, particularly given the recent assessment, the reports that came out immediately prior to COP, um, how do you continue to inspire your citizens and agencies to stay committed to the cause when the data is showing that greenhouse gases are continuing to um, increase uh, globally? And then related to that, uh, we really appreciated the role of Greta Thunberg, citizen of Sweden, who truly has become an inspiring international sensation. And I just wondered if each of you could talk a little about uh, how, how you get the message out. How do you inspire your citizens to get the level of engagement and these huge impacts which you've achieved over the last uh, decade? So I'm not sure where uh, we should start here. Uh, sh should we go through the same sequence? Right, I'll start. Um, well, of course, it is very, uh, how do you say, disheartening or, or worrying that we are actually not, on a global scale, cutting back emissions. But I have the feeling, at least in my country, that people are sparked that, by that we have been able to do better and that we must be uh, given, you know, uh, the wealth of Sweden, uh, being top ranked in most everything uh, in the world, that we must really lead by example. And maybe this sounds a bit, how do you say, not patronizing, but I, I really do believe that Swedes think and feel that we, we can really show how it can be done. Of course, we live in a very advanced economy with advanced industry and so on. We also are very proud of that we give 1% of GDP in development aid uh, uh, globally, and uh, much of that money is, of course, used to uh, change uh, energy sectors and so on uh, in, in other parts of the world. We, for instance, had a collaboration with the United States called Power Africa, where our contribution was towards fossil-free uh, energy solutions uh, globally. Uh, and then when it comes to inspiring citizens and so on, of course, I think it's uh, Greta Thunberg happens to be a Swedish person, but she could have probably popped up anywhere in the world. But it's amazing to see, and which is very hopeful, that one person, even if it's a young girl, uh, or maybe because it is a young girl, uh, can really get the world stage mm. uh, and talk to us uh, in a way that at least make leaders uh, listen. She uh, stayed with me in Washington for a couple of days and I overheard her saying uh, she and her father were going to New York uh, for, for, the, for the United Nations General Assembly and heard her saying, Dad, we're not taking any meetings below the level of precedence. <laughs> And that really shows the world leaders wants to be seen with this young person because she has had an enormous impact on the youth in their countries. So just happens that she's Swedish, but I really think it's, uh, she's a fantastic symbol. In my country, just to be brief, uh, I think the climate issues have been with us for so long, coming already out of the oil crisis and then of course changing in, in the 90s and also creating an awareness of keeping Sweden clean. So when I was a kid, there were stickers all over, keep Sweden clean, you know, and we learned this in school. Today, only 1% of our waste goes into landfills. We are actually importing waste to burn to energy. So it is possible to change uh, with through uh, awareness. And even now, with the banking system, uh, you see more and more demands for when people take housing loans that they want it to be green financing. So the consumers also want this. And this, of course, makes industry change. So it's all part of a chain reaction in, in so many ways. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I worked with the French president when uh, I was with him when he received Greta Thunberg in Paris, and I, I 
I, I confirm she's very impressive. And she was not alone. She came with uh, young Germans and young Belgians, girls, mm -hmm. having organized uh, school strikes on Fridays. And uh, they, they, they made in incredibly um, um, articulated proposals, for instance, on, on how to foster trains in relation to planes. And so we, as my Swedish colleague, I will answer your question that we have not that much to inspire our citizens. We have our citizens uh, want to push our governments now. It goes the other way, in, at least in my country. Uh, I have four children. One of them refuses to take planes, and one other refuses to ta to to buy to buy. Uh, uh, on, she buys only second-hand clothes, for instance, are two two girls. But uh, I, I mean, it's the young generation. They push us to to do things. Of course, we need. They are not alone. There is a part of the society which has real difficulties. We must understand that. But even those who, in France, under the Yellow Vest movement, protested against a hike in the uh, uh, prices of uh, energy, of petrol, you know, the, the same persons they realize that climate change is a, a, a terrible danger for them and their children and grandchildren, and. They want to have also action against climate change, but at the same time, they feel the transition must be fair. This is a real issue. So uh, three points to answer your question. To, to let the, the, the people, including the younger generations, drive the agenda, push the governments. Second, having a fair transition. And of course, third, having uh, legal incentives. Uh, my colleague mentioned carbon price. To have an operational uh, carbon market it is absolutely essential. To have the right incentives in the tax policy is absolutely essential. Of course, to have the good technical standards. And as my good, uh, Spanish colleague said, we have European-wide, EU-wide uh, standards. So those are the three things to do, I think, if we want to succeed. Thank you. So there isn't much that I can add, but I would like to say um, just a couple of things. Uh, indeed, in the case of Spain, it is also uh, the population that is pushing the government and not the other way around. So we, I've been reading um, opinion polls on how concerned uh, the Spaniards are regarding and what are their views on climate change. So when you ask a question such as, are you concerned about climate change? 89% of them answer, yes, we are. Do you support the government adopting new laws, uh, Spanish Green New Deal to curb uh, carbon emissions, to reach a um, carbon neutral um, production system? 80% say, yes, we are, we support that. But what happens when you ask your citizens, would you be ready to pay more taxes to ensure that we reach our targets on carbon um, emissions. Well, I was surprised to see that 59% of Spaniards are ready to pay more taxes if it's for that, for that purpose. So that gives you an idea of how uh, involved this society is and how uh, much awareness there is and how this news about global carbon emissions not being curbed, according to the latest report, only helped to fuel that feeling and to push the um, public opinion to in turn demand greater action, more firm action from our government. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question here is very related to Maryland. We have about 5,000 kilometers of coastline in the state, which for a small state is a real challenge. Many of those areas are vulnerable and Further, many of the communities living in those vulnerable areas are place-based and they're underserved. It's not often the very wealthy communities. And the question was, um, strategic inland migration, I think you'd call it managed retreat in Europe. Have you had any success in relocation or allowing you know, the wetlands, the biodiversity to migrate inland in the response of to, to sea level rise, because certainly that's a very big issue facing uh, Secretary Haraway Rishio right now. 
Well, we, we have this challenge in France, definitely. By the way, when I visited Louisiana or California, they told me exactly the same thing, because every every country having a cost, uh, and the U.S. has enormous, uh, 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 an incredible um, length of cost, but France has also uh, many uh, uh, many costs, and we we have uh, more and more. Uh, catastrophic events, uh, which uh, right now, in the last days, two or three in a succession, a rapid succession in southeastern France. And indeed, uh, like on the Atlantic Ocean, though on the other side of across Maryland, uh, when we, we can wave at you, uh, but uh, indeed, we, we had a, a, a terrible um, uh, storm and we had exactly this problem so we, we have to relocate uh, people and the first thing to do I think is uh, the management of uh, uh, um, habitations of uh, you, 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 you have to be of course strict to to, to because we our experience is that uh, uh, you have to and I know it is difficult for local authorities to, to, to pay attention when you give uh, permission to, to build uh, houses. Uh, to, now we, ha we, ha we have to, to manage uh, the land, but you, in a way which, uh, which, which is a, a good prevention of what can happen. But of course, we have also to, um, to, to protect the natural um, um, reserves. And we have um, in, the, in the European, in the EU legislation, we have a, an ambitious program called Natura, Natura 2000, which uh, we have been uh, ha having uh, for quite a long, number of years now, which uh, is about protecting the areas which we want to protect for its biodiversity, their biodiversity, through a, cert a set of uh, economic measures, which which are which are, which are painful. They are painful. They create many protests among farmers, among uh, uh, developers, among uh, people, communities wanting to, to have investments. But we have to do it, and we have to keep to that. Thank you. And to explain, 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 and again explain. Yeah. Was there any other comments to add to that before we go to the next one? No. Um, so, so this question is uh, probably a loaded question in the spirit of openness. This is a an appointee to the EU Commission's uh, Sino-EU panel on land and soil. Um, and sh she would just like to know a little more about the experiences that Sweden has had in food waste collection and ethanol production. Uh, compared with France, you're moving more to a zero combustion type uh, tra transportation theme. And uh, sli slightly different emphases there to get to uh, zero emission yeah. transportation? Well, uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, we have, we thought that ethanol uh, in our cars would be the big solution, uh, but then it turned out that it became too expensive and, and, and it wasn't really viable. So we have, have turned away from, from that as becoming the kind of main source of, of, of uh, fuel for our vehicles. So. In Sweden, just like here, you, when we buy uh, gasoline for our cars, it usually has a percentage of some kind of bio, biofuel. But uh, we are looking, uh, doing very much research into, um, you know, Sweden is covered two thirds. We are the size of California. Two thirds of our country is covered in forest and we're only 10 million people. So we have a lot of forest to work on. So a lot of research is being done on uh, fuel from the forest uh, sector. We are even in a, in a um, research program, uh, the Swedish Air Force and the US Air Force, to see if we can find uh, jet fuel, uh, bio jet fuel uh, fr from the forest uh, sector. So this is where we, we put our uh, main effort into. Uh, food waste, uh, there is a big push in my country to diminish food waste. There's actually a chef who just, uh, one of our most famous chefs, visited New York. His whole um, cooking, uh, I'm sure in France there must be even more of this uh, idea is that there should be absolutely no waste. We should eat everything that we, of the plant and so on. Mm. Uh, I've tried his cooking and it's really, uh, it was even a butter made on, uh, what do you call it? When you, when you brew coffee, the things that get left over, what do you call it? The coffee? Um, 
right, yeah, put into the butter. Very tasty, I can assure you. Uh, so there's a big push for this. And also at the European Union, uh, it's not only food waste, but of course a lot of the, I think one, one big issue is the packaging of our food. Uh, so there is now uh, legislation, I believe, coming up in the European Union on uh, lessening plastic waste, forbidding plastic when it comes to, to, to food packaging and so on. I think this is very important. Uh, and I think you have quite a lot to do uh, here uh, when it comes to packaging uh, and so on. So uh, that's one very important area of both food and waste and, and packaging, which goes together, of course. And I, I read somewhere in our briefing papers that 90% of our waste on the beaches is plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really need to, uh, on the European Union level, so this is something we really must tackle. So I'm very happy for the legislation. And here, in many places in the US, when you go to a cafe, they ask you if you want a straw, or, and then if you do, it's usually out of paper. It's very good. Well, thank you. Uh, anyone wish to uh, add to the response? No. No. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the next question here is also something that I think certainly facing this state that uh, we have goals for 2030 and often that's, I think some of you mentioned that those are some of the easier actions to take. And the question just wondered what kind of reduction measures are on the table for getting both to 40% and eventually close to 100% reduction in greenhouse gases. So lo looking out a little bit further than the immediate targets which you mentioned. Well, you know, you, you, you have uh, different sectors. In the EU legislation, you have uh, sectors which are uh, capped or which are taken care of through uh, what we call the ETS system, emission trading system, and other non-ETS sectors, which are more difficult, but which, because uh, they are more based on uh, individual uh, behaviors. But, so whatever the, the sectors of the economy and of the society which give rise to greenhouse emissions are handled differently according to whether they are ETS or non-ETS. But anyway, um, we have indeed um, a great uh, challenge in transport, a big challenge in energy, energy efficiency, but there is one other sector which is absolutely essential if we want to reach our uh, goals and which is a bit less in, in the conversation, which is housing. And it is absolutely crucial, in my country at least, because uh, I know for my personal example, we, we, are, we are lagging behind what we should have done already uh, in uh, securing, uh, well, there are plenty of good experiences on neutral houses and buildings, but um, as far as private uh, housing, and even uh, professional uh, office uh, building is cons are concerned, it's, we are very, very far from the objective. I think that this is absolutely crucial. Um, and of course, there is also agriculture, which is absolutely important, where we have to develop things. And I think what you have discussed in your introduction is very interesting because agriculture can not only be um, a sector with uh, lower emissions, but agriculture can even be a, an answer to, uh, to sequestrate, to capture carbons. And we have launched at Paris uh, at the end of 2015 the four, four, Thousand initiative, which is uh, which is uh, uh, aimed at capturing uh, for uh, 0.4 percent of emissions uh, into soils uh, through crops, and we we try to uh, have uh, as many uh, not only countries but also uh, businesses and uh, uh, NGOs in this uh, uh, coalition. So agriculture and housing are two very important sectors also. Thank you. Any other? Just we can sell you three glass windows. We are very energy efficient because it's so cold where we live <laughs> and we had an oil crisis. <laughs> One of the questions here, actually there were several questions essentially asking the same thing, but the question was, one of the controversial points is what role does nuclear energy have 
uh, moving forward. And I'm sure there's very strong differences uh, between the various countries. So perhaps each, uh, if you could just say a little about your national approach to what role nuclear energy has in your future national energy budgets. Well, France being considered usually as a, <laughs> a country which has many, which is true, electricity powered by nuclear, I will start. Um, we, in our um, newest uh, framework energy uh, legislation, we decided to to go down for the share of nuclear energy in the production of electricity, I, I, I underline electricity, not energy, mm -hmm. from 75 to 50 percent until 2035. And, uh, nu nuclear, because we, we want to increase the share of renewables, uh, but uh, nuclear energy is a zero emission energy. So for us, considering the, the, the place it has in our energy mix, uh, it is very important in, the, in, the, uh, in view of the goal of uh, carbon neutrality, of course, because it's a zero emission energy. So for us, it belongs to our global strategy uh, for, uh, against climate change. We recognize that there are absolute uh, necessities for the safety, and uh, we have the issue of storage, but um, uh, waste storage, but uh, it's uh, it's really important. Although we want to decrease its its share, it's true that inside the EU there is a divide between countries which have uh, given up uh, nuclear energy and, and countries which keep, uh, like France, which keep uh, nuclear energy in the energy mix. But uh, it does not prevent the EU from having its uh, own uh, and EU-wide uh, energy and climate policy. So in, in Spain, we still have um, a small share of nuclear energy in our energy mix, but the pressure is uh, higher and higher to um, substantially reduce and eventually eliminate it. Our targets are um, also uh, on the share of renewable energy. So now our electricity is 40% of our electricity is based on renewable sources and our target in 2030 is to reach 70% of electricity produced by renewable sources spain is a, a world leader in in investments and in production of um, um, generation of um, energy through renewable sources and many of uh, the turbines that you see in many U.S. states uh, come from Spain. Um, so that is, that is our target, uh, to increase um, the uh, um, production of um, electri electricity um, from uh, renewable sources and also that the consumption um, of energy in Spain, which at the moment is below 20%, is from renewable energies to reach by 2030 to reach 35. But but the nuclear energy is still in the in the mix, though uh, with a very small percentage. In Sweden, 40% uh, of our energy comes from uh, nuclear power. 40% comes from the rivers up north, uh, so water power through the rivers and turbines. And then 20% uh, is other sources. We don't use oil or gas for, for any of our in energy. So we don't, we don't import uh, any of that for, for our energy mix. There is not really a debate on diminishing nuclear uh, right now in my country. Uh, there was a small, um, in the spring, the Conservative Party, which is not up in, our, in, in government right now, said instead of saying, um, that we should uh, have a uh, you know, renewable energy mix, we should have a fossil-free energy mix, which means uh, keeping our nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, power. And, and we are keeping our nuclear power. Uh, but we are not build, there's a government decision that we will not build new reactors uh, funded by uh, government um, um, funding. But if there are private actors that would like to build a nuclear reactor, that is perfectly fine. But it's very few who can afford that. Uh, so that will not happen. So, uh, yeah, this is the, the way we look at it in my country. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And I'm going to do one uh, very short directed question to Ms. Frail. And this is just, uh, we know that 
uh, Spain has made a priority for water and sanitation with the UN SDGs and things like that. And I just wondered, the question was, would you like to elaborate just a little bit on how you see addressing climate change with um, water sanitation, essentially managing the entire water cycle under climate change? Thank you. So um, the development, the sustainable development goals as established in the 2030 agenda, um, many of them are related to uh, climate change issues, to climate action. Um, one of them, I, I believe it's um, sustainable development, development goal 13 is precisely devoted to climate action. And then many others are related to issues that somehow interact with climate change issues. So it is, it is true that Spain, together with Germany, has been um, um, pushing in the international uh, community, and particularly in the human rights field, for the definition of a what is called a new human right. It's not exactly a new human right. It is the development of the right a right that is enshrined in the UN um, Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights, which is the right to a dignified life, which includes, as has been established by experts throughout the years, the access to water and the access to sanitation. So a very simple gesture, today the glass is playing a very important role in my speech, as you see. Um, this very simple gesture of drinking water, which is of no consequence to us, or the fact of uh, going to the restroom before or after an event uh, such as this, is of no great consequence for us because we have access to it. But just imagine how many millions people in the world do not have access to clean, affordable, um, healthy water or to um, toilets. Um, so this is an aspect in which Spain has been extremely active together with Germany, and we have been working together in the UN, um, both in Geneva and in New York, in the definition of these two human rights, the right to water and the right to sanitation. And today there is in Madrid, uh, um, happening at the same time as the COP25, inside the COP25, there is a very important event on these issues together with the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of um, um, to Water and Sanitation to discuss the issues of why is, this, why is the access to water and sanitation relevant to the sustainable development goals and therefore to the goals of a um, carbon-free um, um, planet. So it is, it is, you know, you are very much aware we're in, in Baltimore, surrounded by water. We're an, in an institution that dedicates um, um, its time to research and investigation on water issues. So it is, uh, I am sure that most of you, of you will be um, um, sensitive to this issue. Um, the access to water and to, to unpolluted and drinkable water and the access to sanitation are essential development goals that, um, that are part of the 2030 agenda and very much related to climate action issues. Well, thank you for that remark. And I was reminded that we're out of time and this has really been a wonderful session, but far too short. Events like this take many, many folks behind the scenes, and we'd particularly like to thank the European Union Ambassador's staff to the United States for making this happen, as well as our Maryland Secretary of State Office for suggesting and helping plan the event. I would particularly like to thank Secretary Hadaway Riccio for being here, Treasurer Kopp, Chancellor Caret, and of course the representatives from Portugal, Sweden, France, and Spain. And for you all for being here. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to meet. As a parting message, and as you can see, there's a lot of questions coming from our research and agency community here. But as a parting message, we'd like to thank you for this message of hope, just to know what's going on elsewhere in the world. But please take with you the message that Maryland is still in. As you mentioned, we are part of the US Climate Alliance with a bipartisan commitment, so we're one of the very few states that's in that position. 
Our universities, as you heard, are a leader in the Climate Leadership Network and Second Nature uh, that's represented at COP this week. Our Secretary of Environment, Ben Grumbles, is actually in Madrid as we speak. But this state also takes its higher education very seriously. The 12 institutions within the University System of Maryland, together with our sister institutions, Morgan State University, St. Mary's, and of course, Johns Hopkins, form a very strong academic foundation for environmental sustainability, mitigation, resilience, and adaptation to climate change. Collectively, as a higher education system, we are open to collaboration with your country's experts. As you heard, we already have many connections. We would be very interested around some of these big questions you raised, the healthy soils, biodiversity here, harmful algal blooms that are on the rise worldwide. Some of the very top researchers in the world are in this room. So we're open to this future collaboration, and I will try and summarize these questions. And we hope that this is just the start of a greater collaboration with the efforts you have underway in the EU. So thank you for your participation today. And I think we have a, a small gift for e each of you as a memory for visiting Maryland. Thank you.